As we discussed in our special session yesterday afternoon on the theme, New and Emerging Powers, Military Capabilities and Strategies, robust defense spending and military upgrading programs are characteristic of a number of countries that are more or less exempt from the contemporary economic gloom of North America and Europe. Efforts to expand national military capacity supported by growing military spending are particularly apparent across Asia. We hear a lot about China's military programs. Indeed, these are the subject of a special essay in our latest annual strategic survey published last week. But other Asian states as diverse as India, Vietnam, Singapore, Thailand, Indonesia, and Malaysia, and the Republic of Korea are also spending more on their armed forces year by year and developing more significant military capabilities. The aim of this plenary session is to explore why this is happening and where it is leading. What are the implications of expanding military capabilities in the Asia Pacific region, not just in the region itself, but globally? We have a distinguished panel for this plenary session, Michael Schiffer, Deputy Assistant Secretary of Defense for Asian and Pacific Security Affairs in the U.S. Defense Department on my far right. Peter Ho, Senior Advisor for the Center for Strategic Futures in Singapore and member of the IISS Council on my immediate right. And I should say that Peter had an extremely distinguished career in Singapore's civil service and at one stage was permanent secretary in Singapore's Ministry of Defense. And on my immediate left, Vice Admiral Bangara, uh, former Chief Southern Naval Command of Indian Navy. And on my far left, Professor Aaron Friedberg from the Woodrow Wilson School of Public and International Affairs at Princeton. I will ask our distinguished panelists to speak in the order which is listed in the program, each of them will speak for around uh, 10 minutes. And I turn, first of all, to Michael Schiffer. Yes, please. Thank you for joining us this morning, and, and to thank uh, IISS for all the hard work uh, that, that went into pulling this, uh, the, this panel together. Um, before I begin, uh, I, I'd like to uh, ask, however, for uh, a couple of seconds of uh, silence to remember the victims of uh, September 11th at the World Trade Center and the, and the Pentagon. Uh, well, again, thank you, uh, thank you very much, and uh, thank you very much for giving me this opportunity to. Uh, uh, to talk from the perspective of the, the Obama administration and the Department of Defense regarding defense and security trends in the Asia-Pacific region. Uh, while I've been asked to address the rise of a militarized Asia, I think it's important to begin by highlighting the extent to which the Asia-Pacific region has evolved over the past 60 years. Despite lingering territorial disputes and political differences, the Asia-Pacific region is integrated in a way which would have been hard for most observers to imagine even a generation ago. With the exception of a very few states, economic growth and integration has been the dominant theme in the region in recent decades. This dramatic growth of the Asia-Pacific region constitutes one of the most important geostrategic developments of our time. Consider that the region boasts 15 of the world's 20 largest ports, with nine located in China alone. Yet the region also claims five of the world's largest standing armies. China, now with the world's largest economy, sits at the fulcrum of these developments. As much as any other nation, it will help define if the region's future holds continued stability and growth or uncertainty. The region's unprecedented economic success and dynamism in recent decades was not a foregone conclusion. Rather, it was enabled by clear choices about the enduring principles and concomitant security architecture that are essential to peace, prosperity, and stability. These include free and open commerce, a just international order that emphasizes the rights and responsibilities of all nations, 
and of fidelity to the rule of law, open access by all to the global commons of sea, air, space, and now cyberspace, and the principle of resolving conflict through peaceful dialogue and diplomacy. Certainly, there have been some disputations uh, to, to the peace and some disruptions to the peace since the end of the Second World War in the Asia-Pacific region. But on balance, it has been an era of remarkable stability and prosperity, facilitated in large part by a sustained U.S. presence in the region and our engagement with our Asian allies and partners. Remarkable as this period of growth and transformation has been, however, historical lessons provide us with some cause for concern. Periods of major power transition, much like we are currently experiencing, have tended to be accompanied by discord, uncertainty, instability, and conflict. Sources of potential friction in the region are many. Achieving a lasting peace on the Korean Peninsula remains a critical challenge for the United States and for the international community. Pyongyang's efforts to develop a nuclear and advanced missile capability and its aggressive provocations pose not just an existential threat to South Korea, but to the stability of the entire region. The 2010 Shonan and Waipido incidents underscores the potential for volatility. Turning to China's military modernization, I want to stress at the outset that the United States does not view China as an adversary. It is natural for a rising power, even a peacefully rising power, to expand its military capabilities. The United States has stated repeatedly that we welcome the rise of a strong, prosperous, and successful China that reinforces international rules and enhances security and peace both regionally and globally. Indeed, China's steady integration into the global economy creates new incentives for partnership and for security cooperation, as we are witnessing, uh, for example, in the anti-piracy efforts in the Gulf of Aden. However, China's rapidly expanding capabilities can also increase the risk of misunderstanding and miscalculation. And without careful management, China's rapidly expanding capabilities also hold the potential for the sort of regional instability which can fuel regional militarization. That is not an outcome that any of us, the United States, China, or others in the region, seek. Last month, the Department of Defense released its annual report to Congress on military and security developments involving the People's Republic of China. We noted China's March 2011 of a 12.7% increase in military expenditures, sustaining more than two decades of robust military investment. China's ambitious pursuit of military platforms and weapons include aircraft carriers, long-range missiles, as well as modern surface ships and submarines, and it captures growing regional and international attention. In recent years, China's Navy has been operating at greater distances from the mainland, including a more routine presence in the heavily disputed South China Sea and East China Sea. These developments tend to elicit concern and anxiety in the international community, particularly among China's neighbors. Without greater transparency, China's neighbors can only try to infer China's strategic intent from the capabilities that it develops. This sort of strategic guesswork is not a recipe for regional stability. The United States is concerned that these uncertainties could catalyze regional or global balancing efforts. In fact, we have already been seeing China's neighbors, some of China's neighbors, increasingly invest in their own navies, including acquisitions of, man, of modern submarines. While well, we believe that it is reasonable for states in the region to seek to develop adequate and appropriate military and security capacity and are committed to working with our allies and partners as they do so, uh, it is in neither China's interest nor that of the international community to see Asia engaging in a cycle of escalating military competition. Both President Obama and President Hu have spoken of building a relationship that can generate non-zero outcomes, and that is what we seek. China's sustained modernization also has important implications for Taiwan, as the cross-strait military balance continues to shift in the mainland's favor. While we welcome the improvements in economic and political ties that we've witnessed across the strait since 2008, we have yet to see similar progress from Beijing when, uh, when it comes to how Beijing is approaching the cross-strait military and security sphere. So while we understand that China's military modernization is in part a natural function of, of its growth, and while we seek to encourage China's positive engagement in the region and around the globe, the lack of transparency with which China has pursued its rapid military modernization has raised questions in Washington and in the region. As long as observers perceive a gap between China's stated intentions, its growing capabilities, and its actions, it will be difficult for China to convince the international community that its intentions are completely benign. We recognize that this is a remarkably complex moment in history for China as it, as it acquires new capabilities 
and begins to play a greater role in the region and in global economic and security affairs. And it is this very uncertainty about China's future capabilities and intentions that makes the military component of the bilateral relationship so extraordinarily challenging and so extraordinarily important to get right. And in fact, our approach towards China, based on efforts to expand our bilateral cooperation, on our region-wide commitment uh, to strengthen alliances and partnerships, and on a firm insistence on global norms and international rules and, instit and institutions, is aimed precisely at trying to get this and get this relationship right. Both President Obama and President Hu have recognized the need to strengthen the U.S.-China military-to-military relationship, expressing that sustained and reliable military-to-military -military contacts at all levels can help reduce miscommunication, misunderstanding, and the risks of miscalculation, and can help build the sort of mutual understanding and mutual trust necessary for strategic stability. Without a stable and reliable and continuous military-to-military -military relationship between the United States and China, the peace and prosperity we've achieved in the region over the past six decades may quickly erode. At the Department of Defense, we have a special responsibility to monitor military developments throughout the Asia-Pacific region and to ensure that no actor or actors upends the regional security balance. We recognize that an effective, affordable, and sustainable U.S. defense posture, allowing the United States to meet our obligations to our allies and partners and to regional security and stability, requires a broad portfolio of U.S. military capabilities with maximum vers versatility across the widest possible spectrum of, of scenarios. Fielding these capabilities and demonstrating the resolve to use them, if necessary, assures friends and potential adversaries alike of the credibility of the U.S. security commitments. Confronting these challenges and promoting sustained regional stability is not the task of any one nation acting alone. In this, all of us have responsibilities that we must fulfill since all will bear the cost of instability, as well as uh, reap the benefits and rewards of international cooperation. Our principal task is to continue to develop and nurture the norms, the institutions, the infrastructure, and the architecture that have facilitated security in the region. Uh, and as I'm speaking today in my childhood home of Geneva, I'll add that this is an obligation not just for those of us in the Asia-Pacific community, but for Europe and the entire international community as well. Although Asia's transformation holds great promise, the future is far from certain. The size and complexity of the Asia-Pacific region and the realities of the new patterns of the distribution and diffusion of power in the region across virtually every dimension, economic, military, diplomatic, political, cultural, uh, across the board, makes the course of regional events inherently difficult to predict. It is understandable under these circumstances that uncertainty and anxiety would lead to, a, to a, a militarization of the region and potentially to, to an arms race dynamic. Such a future for Asia would be a great loss for us all. In anticipation of these potential challenges then, the time to build habits of trust and cooperation is now. These behaviors cannot be switched on uh, only during times of ease if we are to be certain that they will not be switched off during times of difficulty. It is precisely when our differences seem greatest when trust and cooperation are most difficult to maintain, that we must resist the temptation to assume the worst of each other and work even harder to maintain open and continuous communication. Not only will this commitment maximize our mutual interests and mitigate our differences, but moreover, it will gradually forge common bonds and solidify common interests that will serve as the basis for a new era of peace, stability, and prosperity in Asia. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, Peter Ho. Thank you, Tim. Uh, good morning to all of you. Uh, the United States has the largest defense budget in the world today, and in Asia, its nearest competitor is China, but with a declared defense budget one-fifth the size of the U.S. The next largest defense budget belongs to Japan, which is half the size of China's, and a twelfth the size of the United States. India's is even smaller. But what is perhaps more interesting is that between 2000 and 2010, China's defense budget almost quadrupled, while Japan's held steady. Not surprisingly, because of Afghanistan and Iraq, the U.S. defense budget during that same period 
more than doubled. India, South Korea, Australia and Thailand also saw their defence budgets more or less double in size. Indonesia's tripled, Pakistan's increased by a third. The only country in Asia to see a decline in its defence budget during the same period was Sri Lanka because of the end of the civil war. Increases in defence expenditures will translate over time into larger and more modern militaries. The question is whether this necessarily points to the rise of a militarised Asia. An element of militarisation is a willingness to use the military for more than defensive purposes. In Asia, in the last few years, there has been a rise in tensions over several competing claims in the South China Sea. Japan and China dispute ownership of the Senkaku, Diaoyu Islands, and South Korea and Japan over the Dokdo, Takashima Island. But while these flare up from time to time, my view is that they are unlikely to lead to war between states. The more dangerous flashpoints lurk in the Korean Peninsula, the Taiwan Strait, and at the border between India and Pakistan. These flashpoints all have the potential to escalate into war, with not just regional, but also global implications. But in the last few decades, two of these three flashpoints have been managed mostly not through military force, but through largely structured diplomatic processes, bilaterally through the Kuwang talks over the Taiwan issue, and multilaterally in the case of the Korean Peninsula, through the six-party talks. This approach, rather than overt military pressure, has presented, prevented them from erupting into open conflict. However, the Kargil War of 1999 and the 2002 India-Pakistan military standoff at the international border in the line of control both threatened more than a limited military encounter because of the danger of escalation into a nuclear war between the two countries. The US Quadrennial Defense Review, or QDR, of 2010 has a sanguine assessment of India's military buildup, stating that as its military capabilities grow, India will contribute to Asia as a net provider of security in the Indian Ocean and beyond. In contrast, the QDR has a sharper assessment of China, stating that lack of transparency and the nature of the Chinese military development and decision-making processes raise legitimate questions about its future conduct and intentions within Asia and beyond. Indeed, the PLA has been upgrading, especially in the last decade or so. It has developed and acquired fourth generation fighter aircraft equivalent to the F-15s and F-16s. And most recently, it unveiled a stealth fighter aircraft, the J-20. The PLA Navy is also upgrading, seeking a transformation from a brown water to a blue water capability. The renovation of the Russian Varyak aircraft carrier reflects this ambition, as does the PLA Navy's deployment to the Gulf of Aden for anti-piracy operations. This upgrading is systemic, as the force modernization has apparently been accompanied by an effort to improve professionalism and interoperability within the PLA. However, while the Chinese military power will increase relative to the US, it is probably still a couple of decades behind the US in terms of capabilities and technologies. It has also not undertaken the transformation that is commonly termed the Revolution in Military Affairs, or RMA. In quantitative terms, China will not catch up with the US unless it stops spending on defense. Instead, it has opted to pursue an asymmetric strategy, including demonstrated capabilities in cyber war, an emerging capability in missile technology, and the upgrading of its submarine fleet as part of its excess denial strategy. But the US also spends roughly 10% of its defense budget on R&D, not counting what industry spends. This is another area where the US has a huge advantage that the Chinese will need a very long time to overcome, if ever. A realist would argue that the growth of the military is almost a given among the great 
and emerging powers. All such powers want to maintain a favourable balance of power, if not to gain a strategic advantage. However, others might argue that military power is a potent element of national pride and self-image, and this is especially so for the emerging powers. This argument has some resonance in China's case. Its growing military power has a lot to do with the way that China characteristically draws on its historical experience. In the present day, with China as a global power that is rapidly acquiring the comprehensive attributes of a superpower, political, economic, and military, it is easy to forget that China spent almost spent most of the early 20th century as a semi-colonial state carved up by Western and Japanese imperialism. The rhetoric of Chinese leaders even in the 21st century shows a profound consciousness of this historical past and an entrenched perception of itself as a victim state, even if no one else sees it as such. Thus, the Chinese appear to feel a strong need to be taken seriously as a global player this means that, among other things, military power must be acquired. And this, I believe, is a major reason for the rapid buildup of the PLA in recent years. The question is how much of an active threat this poses. We see China's desire for international respectability and influence, the desire to be taken seriously, more often than not taking the form of actions in more peaceable spheres such as in the drive to play a greater role in international multilateral groupings like ASEAN Plus 3, Shanghai Cooperation Organization, or in hosting spectacular events such as the 2008 Beijing Olympics and the 2010 Shanghai World Expo. In the 21st century, the driving force in international relations is not necessarily material capability or military power, but identities, perceptions, and norms. In today's context, the identity of China does not seem to be so strongly based on military capability. Indeed, since the PLA's punitive military incursion into China in 1979 to teach it a lesson, the Chinese have eschewed any form of military adventurism. Instead, it has pursued a soft power approach that depends on China's, depends on, more on China's political and economic influence rather than on military strength. In the first half of the 20th century, a combination of many highly militarized states and an ideology of militarism in some of them led to two world wars. Since then, the focus of international relations has been on diplomacy aimed at creating behavioral norms through bilateral and multilateral institutionalism and other soft power channels. Hence, the issue is not whether we face increasing threats from the military buildup in Asia. It is whether behavioral norms among states can be established such that a world ruled by law instead of a world ruled by force emerges, norms that level the playing field on which all states, big and small, interact with one another. So that there will not be a rise of a militarized Asia, the emphasis should be on promoting transparency building confidence, increasing predictability in state-to-state -state relations, strengthening civility by subjecting states to the judgment of their peers, and providing alternative channels of communication when bilateral channels fail to work. In Asia, a regional architecture defined by a network of groupings centered on ASEAN that, that engage regional and global powers has emerged over a period of more than four decades. These include the ASEAN post-ministerial conferences, ASEAN Plus One, ASEAN Plus Three, APEC, the ASEAN Regional Forum, and most recently, the East Asia Summit. This complex web of overlapping groupings have helped to manage relations among the major powers in the region and has gone a long way to reduce the potential for conflict and war. The last major institution in Asia to embrace multilateralism is the defense establishment. Ten years ago, the IISS Shangri-La Dialogue kicked off an effort to socialize the defense establishment in the Asia-Pacific region into the benefits of multilateral dialogue. Even though a track to event, the Shangri-La Dialogue today 
can justifiably claim to be an important part of the intricate network of institutional fora in the Asia-Pacific region. Indeed, in 2002, the private discussions that took place behind the scenes during the Shangri-La Dialogue helped to diffuse the India-Pakistan standoff. We also now have the ASEAN Defence Minister's meeting established in 2002, which is the first major platform in the region to institutionalise the engagement of Defence Ministers of ASEAN, and now this has been expanded to the ADMM Plus 8. Of course, such meetings are often criticised as being just talk shops, NATO, no action, talk only. They cannot solve all problems. But the various elements in the regional architecture have a value in promoting dialogue and consultation. Conducted regularly from the summit level down to the level of senior officials, specialised professionals, academics and business community, even youth groups, civil society organisations, these meetings collectively have helped to develop a habit of consultation rather than confrontation, promoting trust and respect rather than suspicion and ignorance. Transparency is a real issue. It is an ongoing challenge to persuade nations, whether in Asia or elsewhere, to detail and explain their defence policies and military acquisitions. Nevertheless, in Asia, some progress has been achieved in this area. Since 2001, the ASEAN Regional Forum has published the annual ARF Security Outlook. Over time, ARF members have become more open in their write-ups for the ARF Security Outlook. This is, a much, this is as much a process of confidence building as it is a snapshot of transparency in defence and security policy in the ARF region. The increase in defence budgets in the Asian region mirrors the growth of Asian economies since the Asian financial crisis. The stronger growth, the more a country is able to spend on defence. In Asia, the emphasis is on process and consensus. The West, in contrast, has a propensity to emphasise competition and to look for immediate outcomes, and often dismisses regional institutions as top shops with little impact. This is a significant cultural divergence that needs to be narrowed. Clearly, the rise of China and India within a very short period of time has created a new strategic dynamic in Asia. This poses risks to the region and beyond because it challenges the traditional dominance of the US. But it would be a self-fulfilling prophecy to only focus on the perceived threats of a militarized Asia. Instead, the focus should be to shape the regional architecture that manages relations in the region, especially among the major powers, such that the diplomatic approach is emphasized and that military buildups do not increase tensions or result in risky behavior. To this end, countries in Asia, as well as others which are major stakeholders in the region, should be encouraged to build collaborative and inclusive mechanisms and to participate in multilateral platforms that emphasize cooperation, consultation, and confidence building. Thank you. Thank you very much, Peter. Uh, Vice Admiral Bangara. <coughs> Ladies and gentlemen, uh, IISS has asked me to place uh, today's discussion, my part of it, in the context of India and China, the two Asian giants which until 1800 made up half the world's economy. I have been allotted 10 minutes and I'll stick to the 10 minutes. Uh, I want to approach the subject rather differently. For the last day, uh, we have been looking at the survey or the review at 30,000 feet. I would like to bring you down closer to the sea level if I can, because sometimes the worms I view also matters in estimating military effectiveness. And when we assume that militarization of the area would have consequences, the first thing we would like to understand, as a military man at least I would like to understand, is what is that militarization leading to in terms of military combat efficiency? So I am going to approach that, and I, for that I have used anecdotal references of uh, interaction with senior Chinese delegations during the fag end of my four-decade-long association with the Indian Navy. 
I have, after retirement, spent some time with Andrew Yang, who was an academic in Taiwan, uh, who gave me an insight of uh, how they see the Chinese, and I'm very grateful to him, and he's now a minister. Um, so the military man looks at it slightly differently because he's bombarded with data from the academics, the historians, the analysts, who very often get it wrong, and he has to clean up the mess. So he looks at it quite differently. And um, so I looked at what are the aspects that I could borrow from to establish the military efficiency of China and India. Now, uh, of all the many formulae that have existed uh, from pre-Cold War to post-Cold War, Cold War times, uh, when the Soviet Union collapsed, all the theories also collapsed with it. And so we were looking for something new. And uh, uh, Ambassador Blackwell's protege about a decade ago came out with a simple formula which appealed to me. He said strategic resources plus conversion capability is equal to combat efficiency. Now strategic resources is a term that all of you understand. But what is this conversion capability? Um, conversion capability includes factors such as ability to strategize, the civil-military relations, and in particular the decision-making structures of the respective armed forces, ability to cooperate with other military forces to establish the broad contours of interoperability, the ability to clearly articulate and execute doctrines related to training operations, including joint operations, and finally, the intangible, the ability as a nation and as a military to innovate. And I thought I will borrow some of these and flag a few issues in my 10 minutes. Firstly, the ability to strategize has been displayed more robustly by China than India, notably post the Cultural Revolution. The strike hard campaign, which was called Yanda, against the secessionist movements and modernization of the Navy under well outlined schemes referred to as Jinyang Fundyu are some examples. Secondly, in the area of military, civil military relations, China has little to worry because they are. There is really no civil military relations. The orders come down from the CMC, funded and executed with clear accountability. India, on the other hand, has decades of debate at sporadic intervals, which lead to inordinate delays in modernization programs of great urgency. Also, budgetary allocation in the Indian context may not always be based on long-term plans, and it is based on expediencies. It is obvious that the major modernization programs in both countries began as a consequence of sustained and impressive increase in the growth of their respective economies. The Chinese program, arguably, have been structured to meet the challenges posed by the USA and her allies, hence the emphasis on long-range missiles, cyber warfare, space-based programs, and nuclear submarines. The Indian program is aimed to contain a worst-case scenario of collusive offense by her consanguous, consanguineous neighbor and China. Thirdly, in terms of military to military cooperation, India is well ahead of China. The Indian Armed Forces have had the added advantage of proficiency in English language, and more particularly, of having maintained reciprocal training arrangements with the leading countries of the world right through the Cold War era. Most basic tactical documents, and I mean basic doc tactical documents of the Indian Armed Forces, have been supplied or derived from the Allied documentation, which is normally called the Allied Tactical Publications, the ATP, or the Allied Exercise Programs, the AXPs, that many of the younger ones may not know about this. The Indian Navy is hence equipped to seamlessly work with any Western Navy in the world due to this unique advantage. In operational terms, this is an invaluable asset, to say the least. The Indian Navy operates quite regularly, as do her sister services, with USA, France, UK, and Russia on an annual basis. And Indian naval ships are seen often in distant waters, including the South Indian Ocean, the Far East, Mediterranean, the Pacific Ocean, etc. Regular forays into the South China Sea, including port visits to China, and other littorals, as also her ability to conduct bilateral exercises with leading navies of that region and beyond, give her a semblance of respectability and international recognition. The clinching argument here 
is the fact that many of the structured annual exercises with leading navies is in the realm of advanced exercises of anti-submarine warfare, carrier operations, and the like of it, including the non-traditional threats. Fourthly, the Indian Armed Forces have reasonably good training and operational doctrines, including one for joint operations, despite the fact that the government is yet to take a decision to integrate the armed forces and allow uniformed personnel to be part of the decision-making process of the Ministry of Defense. Much of the Chinese literature on such subjects is shrouded in mystery. Let me quote a recent example of a Chinese senior naval aviation delegation led by a senior flag officer, which was given access to naval aviation training of Indian naval sailors in Indian training establishments. That a young sailor from a remote village of India, having been familiarized with English during his boot camp phase of training, was found to be proficient enough to deal with complex regimes and documents of naval aviation entirely in English, was noted with more than a passing interest by the visiting delegation. Quite obviously, they were prepared to learn from others so long as it fulfilled their objectives, as is the guiding philosophy of China. Building an aircraft carrier is but the first step. Making it operational in all its dimensions is no mean task. It takes a whole generation of personnel to claim proficiency in flying at sea. The Chinese appear to be well aware of it. Among the strategic resources that I briefly alluded to, let me flag the human resource and how this may impinge on the combat efficiency of China and India, which in turn has consequential impacts on the others, notably USA. That China planned and executed her objectives to significantly upgrade her educational institutions, including the higher educational institution, has been well acknowledged. The results are there to see. A number of Chinese universities now appear in the list of the best 100 universities in the world. The nearest Indian university is perhaps 100 numbers below. The combination of a better trained party, party cadre, a large number of who pass out of the Shanghai Institute of Administration and the Beijing Institute, and a better caliber of bureaucrats as compared to the pre-Deng Xiaoping era due to induction of well-trained personnel indicate a strong desire to match mature policy and decision-making structures that exist in liberal democracies. The Indian system provides very few high-quality institutions compared to the number of aspirants, but those that pass out of those uh, good institutions turn out to be top leaders of Fortune 500 companies later. Given the large population of both India and China and the fierce competition to just make it to the portals of good schools and colleges, both countries will continue to find good quality soldiers and officers to lead them from those that fail to make it to the quote-unquote Ivy League of their respective countries. Here I would like to add a caveat in favor of India. Corruption has been scourge of both the countries. While stringent punishments have failed to curb corruption in China, India has begun to mobilize people's power to put the parliament on notice. The peaceful demonstration by a few million Indians provided the much needed release of pressure valve of discontent of the middle class. While the parliament asserted its rights as a representative democracy and not a majoritarian system, so how is this linked with the potential? Such an event acts to coalesce the efforts of the youth who also wish to serve a voluntary military force. It gives them the confidence, if you had seen the television, to protect a system which is based on established principles of democracy. Secondly, the social media and internet penetration has introduced a unique challenge. Instant information has the potential to inflame and channel frustration. While China continues to crack down on dissemination of information, as in the case of the recent accident of the high-speed train, irrespective of what the white paper of 7th September says, India is set to expand and expedite the flow of information. Soldiers, sailors, and airmen, ladies and gentlemen, cannot be isolated from the mainstream happenings, which, if continued, will witness adverse reactions among the rapidly modernizing forces of any country, including China. Thirdly, 
By about 2030, and this is critical, just as the two begin to peak in their modernization programs and begin to leave footprints in the sands of time, the Chinese would have begun to age rather rapidly, while the Indian population will consist of nearly 50% of those in their mid-20s. A productive workforce ready to serve the industry and military, both of which are essential elements of national power. Let me now come to the consequences. Given that USA alone accounts for 43% of the world defense expenditure, I agree with my friend Mo, and that posture, review, and budgetary cuts would at best result in realignment, not closure, in the Asia-Pacific theater, significant military investments already made in Korea, Japan, and base facilities and agreements with a number of countries adjacent to China, inter-theater hubs at Guam and Hawaii, a joint US-Korea command, joint tactical command, ground station at Misawa, etc., may remain untouched by the cuts. China has a long way to go before she has adequate resources to challenge the United States of America. Exploiting every opportunity to derive psychological advantage and avoidance of direct conflict, as concluded by Henry Kissinger, who has got, got some real pearls of wisdom in his latest book, um, seems to be a good option for China. Consequently, most of the informed and policy-related documents of China indicate 2030 as the target date, or beyond 2030, to achieve sufficient deterrence against a potent adversary. What of India? Emphasis on high GDP growth, growth rate, and allocation of a perhaps 2.5% of GDP for defense, currently it's about 1.7, should, should see most of our modernization through. The Indian elephant is on the move under the watchful eyes of the dragon. Time will tell as to which model worked better in their respective pursuit to assert themselves in international politics. Thank you. Thank you, Admiral. Uh, Professor Aaron Friedberg. Dr. Huxley, uh, ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much. Uh, the Admiral points out that academics and other analysts often get things wrong, <clears throat> leaving it to the military men to clean it up. Uh, I propose to fulfill my function as an academic by uh, complexifying things a little bit. I find myself more pessimistic than my colleagues. Uh, but no good academic can begin to speak on any subject without questioning the title of the panel in which he was invited to participate. So the title of our panel is The Rise of a Militarized Asia. Uh, but I think we have to begin by asking the question of whether, in fact, Asia is militarized or in the process of militarizing. This is, after all, not a region where nations are arming to the teeth, uh, preparing for or expecting war with one another. Uh, it's not Europe uh, at the turn of the 20th century. It's not Europe in the 1930s. So what is happening? I would describe the developments in the following way, in emphasizing three aspects, and several of these has, have been mentioned. Uh, as compared to the nations of the West, and in particular Europe and North America, uh, basically the other advanced industrial nations, military budgets are growing uh, in absolute terms, although in terms of shares of GDP, they're either staying constant or increasing slightly. Number two, uh, as compared to earlier periods in the history of Asia, the 1960s and 1970s in particular, uh, the focus of military procur procurement programs is not on traditional ground forces for purposes of defending against invasion, or as was the case uh, 30 and 40 years ago, in many instances against internal threats to security and uh, against insurgencies, but rather the emphasis is on the acquisition of modern systems for projecting military power outwards into the air and sea beyond national boundaries, and also, in some cases, uh, an emphasis on acquiring space and C4 ISR assets uh, that are necessary for the effective use of those forces. Number three, these Asian military programs, I would suggest, are not as yet tightly coupled with one another. 
what we see are not yet full-blown action-reaction arms races, but rather, for the most part, parallel military programs. So if this is what's happening, why? The answer is partly uh, a function of the overall modernization of Asian societies, their increasing wealth uh, and technological capabilities. But of course, those factors are not entirely new. As always, I would suggest, historically, the primary driver behind the development of increasing military capabilities is insecurity. And in the case of Asia today, uh, the fear is not primarily one of invasion or conquest, again, as comparison to, to Europe in the 20th century, but rather, I think, a concern that others might be able to use their own developing capabilities to coerce or compel uh, through the application of relatively limited increments of military power to deny or control others' access and use of the global commons, and in particular the sea, uh, and perhaps also to seize and hold contested resources. The primary driver of insecurity in Asia, and hence of the trend, such as it is so far towards militarization, I would suggest is China. If not for the scale, scope, and pace of its military modernization programs, we would not be talking about a militarized Asia. These programs are, in part, a reflection of the larger trend towards modernization that I mentioned earlier. They are also, at least in part, undoubtedly, uh, and certainly from an official Chinese perspective, defensive in nature. But I believe that they also reflect certain clear geopolitical ambitions. Just a few words about China's military buildup. I think its broad outlines are widely known. I refer you to the excellent essay in uh, this year's edition of the Military Balance. For roughly 20 years now, since the mid-1990s, China's military spending, according to its official figures, has been increasing at double-digit rates roughly between 10 and 15 percent annually. Given that China's economy as a whole during this period has been growing at around 10 percent annually, this means that China's military outlets, uh, outlays have grown dramatically. Indeed, as Peter Ho suggested, in a decade uh, they've quadrupled. But they have increased, I would say also, relatively painlessly in terms of the burden imposed on China's overall economy. So it's been able to expand its military capabilities dramatically without thus far taking on a heavier and heavier burden. Where is all the money going? In general, since the end of the Cold War and the collapse of the Soviet Union, the overall trend in the development of China's military capabilities has been away from preparation for large, probably nuclear, wars fought along its interior continental frontiers against the Soviet Union towards preparation for what Chinese strategists refer to as local wars under high-tech conditions. In other words, limited, probably conventional wars fought off China's coasts and perhaps along its southern borders. The focus of China's military programs in the last two decades has been on developing the increased capacity to project military power through the air, through the acquisition of high-performance aircraft, and also missiles in large numbers, cruise missiles, and also ballistic missiles. At sea, the acquisition of an increasing number of increasingly sophisticated surface combatants, and also, in some ways, even more impressive, the acquisition of a large and rapidly growing force of submarines the development of increasingly sophisticated C4 ISR capabilities, including satellites uh, and complex communication networks, significant investments in cyber warfare, and also the development of some anti-satellite capabilities. What is the purpose of all of this? What are the goals of China's buildup? In the first instance, China has clearly sought uh, the means to uh, coerce and to subdue Taiwan 
uh, or to prevent it, deter it, and prevent it from movement towards uh, independence. And it has been, in the context of that objective, developing what's been referred to as an asymmetric anti-access area denial strategy against the United States, which appears intended to deter, or if necessary, to defeat American efforts to project military power into the Western Pacific by targeting and destroying the relative handful of bases, ports, airfields uh, in Asia that the United States relies on to support uh, its military capabilities, and also increasingly by developing the capability to hold at risk, or if necessary, to attack and sink American naval vessels, including American aircraft carriers. In the much longer run, China will probably seek to develop the means for projecting power over much longer distances to defend its sea lines of communication, uh, its far-flung assets and interests and personnel. And in the last 10 to 15 years, China has uh, willy-nilly acquired global interests uh, that are extensive and it, which it has acquired at a tremendous pace and which, for the moment, it has virtually no capability to defend. I think we're seeing the first inklings of that longer range power projection capability. Uh, Chinese naval vessels pr participating in anti-piracy patrols, uh, the Chinese Navy rescuing Chinese citizens from Libya in the context of, China, uh, of Libya's recent civil war. That's the longer term. In the interim, I would say, in the next 10 to 20 years, it is beginning to look as if China is aiming for an expanded capability to deny others access to and use of not only the waters and airspace around Taiwan, but to the waters and airspace throughout what some Chinese strategists refer to as the near seas, the waters within the so-called first island chain. At a minimum, uh, China appears to be seeking the ability to deny or to severely constrict others' use of the air and surface uh, uh, space in that area, both com uh, commercial and military, kind of sea-air denial capability, which in a sense is not that difficult. It is not that much of an extension beyond the kinds of capabilities that China has been acquiring thus far, which have appeared to be focused again, primarily on Taiwan, long-range uh, missiles of various kinds, uh, as well as submarines, long-range surface-to-air missiles that make it very dangerous for aircraft to operate now within hundreds of miles of China's coasts. Ultimately, China may also seek uh, the ability to ensure its own capacity to use the waters and airspace within the first island chain for military, but also for commercial purposes. So not only to deny those use, the use of those waters to others, but to ensure China's own capacity to use them. Doing this will be a much bigger challenge, uh, in part because of China's presently very limited capacity for undersea warfare. It's one thing for China to shoot down aircraft operating off its coasts now and to engage surface vessels operating in waters hundreds of kilometers away from its borders. It's quite another for it to find and sink submarines operating in those waters. And at the moment, it has very little capacity to do that. The acquisition of such capabilities would have significant strategic benefits for China. From a defensive point of view, it would allow China to push back others who might seek to launch strikes against Chinese territory or to impose blockades, for example, in the context uh, of local conflicts, including perhaps a war over Taiwan. This kind of capability would also give China a very potent coercive tool. It would give it the capacity to threaten the sea lines that are vital to its neighbors, and especially to Japan, Korea, and of course also Taiwan. And in the somewhat longer term, if China is able to develop this capacity to command and maintain the use of these waters, uh, it could enable them to seize and to hold 
vital resources that are contained within the near seas, and especially oil and, ga and natural gas. China's buildup has begun to provoke concern among its neighbors, as well as the United States. And I think at this point that's something of an understatement. Uh, countries which only relatively recently would have been loath to mention China uh, in white papers and public statements about defense policy have begun to do so. Uh, Japan, Australia, India, the Philippines, Vietnam, Taiwan. So there is concern. But the extent and the nature of the actual concrete responses uh, on the part of these countries over the course of the next decade or two, uh, whether separately or together, remains very much in doubt. In theory, there is no reason why these countries, in combination with the United States, presumably can't act in ways that would enable them to maintain a balance of power favorable to their own security and their own interests, even in the context of China's growing power. In theory, the balance of power should balance. In practice, as we know historically, that is not always what happens. Or it's not always what happens quickly enough to prevent conflict. So whether these countries do act in the ways that I've described remains unclear. What the United States does or doesn't do will be critical, I think, in determining what others do. Now, there are those, including some in the United States, who believe that if the U.S. does less, its friends and allies in Asia will do more. What seems to me more likely is that if others doubt that the United States has the resources and the resolve, uh, they are going, at least some of them, to feel that it's in their best interest to seek the best possible kind of accommodation that they can with China. In my view, the first order of business for the United States, preferably in combination with our friends and allies in Asia, is to find ways to blunt and to counter China's maturing anti-access capabilities. And it's relatively easy to describe the sort of functional tasks that are involved in this, although much more difficult to specify still yet to acquire the capabilities that would allow one to do this. The United States has to find ways of reducing the vulnerability of its fixed bases and installations uh, in the Western Pacific, and to reduce the vulnerability of its C4 ISR networks, including its space assets and its computer networks. It has to acquire the means uh, to conduct precision conventional strikes against targets throughout this area at increasingly long ranges, uh, and in particular from ranges that would exceed the growing range of China's own offensive capabilities. The United States, I think, also has to increase its investment in undersea warfare capabilities, both manned and unmanned. This is an area that remains uh, one of considerable competitive advantage for the United States. And last but not least, because hardware is only part of the problem, the United States needs to develop appropriate concepts of operation and doctrine for using these forces in an integrated way in order to deter conflict. And the so-called air-sea battle concept that we've heard referred to uh, is a first step. Uh, as an outsider, this appears to me to be a nice label, uh, which at the moment is it a, an empty vessel uh, into which various people are emptying the contents of their own ideas, but it's by no means uh, a meaningful doctrine. The problem, of course, is that all of this costs money, and the United States finds itself facing very tight constraints. Now, these are partly, as you know very well, due to economic fac uh, factors, it's deep budget deficits that the United States now has, the efforts to reduce those benefits without, on the one hand, raising taxes, uh, and on the other, without slashing social spending, uh, is going to place strong downward pressure on defense budgets for at least the next decade and probably beyond. So the, the limitations are in part economic, but I would argue that they're primarily political. 
The United States, of course, is the biggest um, economy in the world. We have Aaron, more Aaron, than enough money we need to, to wrap up. Yes, to do this. Uh, but the constraints, I think, are partly, largely political. The American public is in no mood uh, for any kind of active defense competition, certainly after a decade of war. And our leaders and elites are still very divided on the character of the Chinese military challenge and how best to deal with it. So to conclude, looking forward over the coming decade or so, I would say there are three scenarios. It's possible that the pace of China's buildup will slow. Uh, they have enormous economic challenges of their own. It's possible that the United States and its friends and allies will share the burdens and cooperate uh, and build up the kinds of capabilities necessary to maintain uh, a rough balance and to maintain a kind of dynamic form of stability in the region. But there is a third and more worrisome possibility, uh, and that is that China's build-up uh, build will continue, the response of others may be delayed and inadequate, and that this could lead to Chinese uh, overconfidence in as yet untested capabilities, to more aggressive behavior, and to the growing risk of miscalculation and conflict. And I would say that China's behavior in the past two years uh, is not reassuring in this regard. Thank you. We have approximately 12 minutes for uh, questions and answers, so um, could I ask you to make your, your points very briefly? In fact, don't make points, just ask very, very, brief, very brief questions in one short sentence with a question mark at the end. Um, Sanjaya Baru. Thank you, Tim. Uh, my, this question is uh, basically to Mr. Ho. Um, the general proposition of, of the panelists is that with uh, economic growth, countries tend to spend more on defense. Um, that is generally true for Asia. But the fact is that if you go country by country, you find that countries that are in fact increasing their defense spend um, more than the average are the less developing of the Asian economies, Myanmar, North Korea, Pakistan, Cambodia. I mean, it's not the really fastly developing economies of Asia that are spending more on defense. It's the less developed parts of Asia. Um, and what is driving militarization or defense spending in, in these countries? Uh, Mr. Ho spoke about the cooperative, consultative nature of uh, regionalism in the uh, Southeast Asia, but the fact is that between Thailand and Cambodia and Cambodia and Laos, we've had tensions. Between Malaysia and Indonesia, we've had tensions. So uh, there was glossing over those kind of issues, so I was wondering whether he would like to uh, elaborate. My second uh, question is, um, it's quite clear from particularly the last speaker that what is driving uh, both India and China to spend more on defense is concerns about access to resources. I mean, as Admiral Bangara said, it's a Navy which is absorbing more of the resource defense uh, investment both in China and India. And it's all about access to resources, protecting sea lines of communication. Um, so it's not so much about militarization as um, concerns about access to resources as these economies sustain high growth. Thank you very much. Uh, Cho Kong. Thank you, Tim. Uh, two questions. One to Peter Ho. Uh, you mentioned a military, military Wait, one, spending... One question, please. <laughs> okay, I'll, I'll, I'll drop Peter Ho then and put my question to Professor Friedberg. Um, Yan Zhu Tong, in a recent book, argues that uh, relations between states are hierarchical, uh, and he argues uh, that's the way Chinese see the international system. He argues that the U.S. doctrine of legal equality... Uh, between states is essentially hypocritical because that's not how the U.S. sees the world and that's not how the U.S. behaves. How would you respond to that? Thank you. Uh, Professor Dansbeck Gruber. Thank you. Um, triangular relationship, India, Pakistan, China. I would like especially to invite uh, both um, Aaron, my friend Aaron Friedberg and Admiral Banger to say a word or two about uh, the dilemma which uh, might uh, develop out of this um, interaction and 
also the symbolic value that uh, China obviously and apparently not only has, uh, as Aaron Friedberg eloquently brought out, uh, its own um, um, ambitions in uh, enhancing, intensifying and uh, sort of building up uh, its own uh, military, but is also slowly becoming an arms exporter uh, of uh, primary, um, of the primary category and uh, Pakistan has uh, just demonstrated so this new naval agreement uh, that there is uh, a longer development. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Mark Fitzpatrick. Thank you. Uh, little was said in this panel about the most militarized nation in Asia, indeed the most militarized nation in the world the one with the fourth largest army, the largest uh, special forces operations, the one that uh, has uh, unprovoked, uh, at least unprovoked attacks on a neighbor. Are there no global implications to North Korea's uh, militarized uh, uh, state of being? My question is to Aaron. Uh, notwithstanding what you said, Aaron, I do agree with you on, on most points. But just to play devil's advocate, my question is this. China's closest allies in Asia are the North Koreans, Pakistanis, and the Burmese. Uh, if you had friends like those, you would basically have to think about <laughs> some opportunity costs as well as you manage your longer-term strategic footprint in the region. So what are the downsides of China's rise militarily? China is now spending more money on internal security than external security in certain respects. So I would like your comments on both questions. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Aidan Foster Carter. Almost the same as just asked, so I'll be even briefer. Wasn't it a very strange decision by China, seemingly, and contrary to a notorious and false uh, WikiLeak, to support the, the bad Korea, which has no future, uh, at the risk of seriously alienating the good one, which has a long future? Very strange decision. Sorry, your, your views on this, please. I would, wouldn't want to make a comment. Uh, Jonathan Pollock. Uh, thank you. Um, my question is for Aaron Freeberg, although I suppose more broadly it could be for the other panelists as well. And uh, Aaron, uh, very, very interesting presentation. Uh, do you preclude in your scenarios any kind of tolerable strategic understanding between the United States and China? Uh, most of, or all three of these, presume a kind of a separateness of strategy, if you will, uh, on, the, on the three cases that you allude to. Thank you. Thank you. And uh, finally, Masafumi Ishii. Thank you. Uh, this is a question to Michael. Uh, as your budget declines, how would you adjust your priorities? Are you going to withdraw everybody from Europe or, or what? And I uh, just want to hear a strong word of commitment from you to Asia. Thank you very much. Uh, I'd like to give each of our panelists, I'm afraid, only two minutes to respond to that range of very good questions. And um, I think we should run through in, in reverse order. So very, very briefly, uh, Aaron Friedberg first, then Admiral Bangra, Peter Ho, Michael Schiffer, uh, Aaron. Thank you. I apologize if I don't address all the questions that have been asked. Obviously, there isn't time, and many interesting issues have been raised. I don't think the U.S. commitment to the theory of sovereign equality is uh, hypocritical at all. It's the basis for American thinking about the appropriate ordering of the international system. That does not mean that, at least for the last 60 years, the United States hasn't been willing to take on a, leader, uh, a leadership role. Uh, which I think has been to the benefit of virtually everyone else in the world, certainly in the countries of Asia, including China. I don't think it's inevitable, by the way, that the United States will continue to be willing to play that role, uh, and I don't think that that would be a happy outcome for, for anyone. Um, India, Pakistan, China, um, <clears throat> it seems to me that in the long run, uh, the continued existence of Pakistan as a rival, uh, an enemy of India, is a factor that will prevent or limit India's ability to step out and to play a broader strategic role in the region and in the world. Uh, I think that's in the interest of China, which is one of the reasons why China continues to support Pakistan in the ways that it does. The DPRK, obviously very important. Uh, I think in a sense it's been the shield behind which other countries, in particular Japan, have felt freer to develop military capabilities without at least initially uh, explicitly mentioning China. But I think over time, 
uh, it perhaps will become less important in that regard. The one way in which it still could be critical would be if uh, it was perceived by U.S. allies that the United States was no longer as committed to upholding its uh, uh, commitments, in particular extending it nuclear deterrence, uh, and North Korea, as well as trying to have nuclear weapons, others might be tempted to develop uh, such capabilities of their own. Chung Min Lee, I would certainly not choose China's allies versus U.S. allies. I think we have enormous advantages. Certainly if you look at the collective GDP, that's partly my point. There is no reason why the United States, working in co cooperation with its friends and allies, can't maintain a balance of power that's very favorable. I don't think it's inevitable that we will do that, however, uh, and that's what causes my concern. Uh, why China supports the bad Korea, a long and complicated story, but I do think it has partly to do with this larger Chinese uh, view about its role in the region. Uh, it would rather have a bad, relatively weak Korea on its border that was under its tutelage and control, not that it currently is, than it would have a united, strong, democratic Korea allied with the United States on its frontier. Jonathan's question, do I preclude uh, a tolerable strategic arrangement with China? I don't, but I think it is going to have to be based as such arrangements always are between countries that don't fundamentally trust one another on a tolerable balance of power. And if China doesn't perceive that the United States is willing to maintain such a balance, its willingness to engage in what we would consider to be tolerable arrangements in the region uh, is not going to be strong, and that's one of my concerns. Thanks. Um, Admiral Bangra. I was um, thinking about how to answer that question. I think I'll give you a quote instead of answering, and that answers the question in a way. I I'm sure you've read uh, Henry Kissinger's latest book. There is a sentence there which says, uh, China's guiding philosophy is not Confucius and not Machiavellian. And uh, there is another quote that I'd like to make, and that will answer your specific question on the Indo-Pakistan-China, uh, which has partly been answered by my colleague. Chinese diplomacy has learned from millennia of experience that in international issues, each apparent solution is generally an admission ticket to a new set of related problems. And I don't think that they're about to abandon their trusted friends, and that is not going to be seen in the near future. Thank you, Admiral. Peter Ho. Uh, well, I didn't mean to, uh, if I overgeneralized, I didn't mean uh, to. Um, my general point about countries uh, spending uh, more on defense uh, as the economies uh, uh, increase is a general point. Uh, but in response to the specific subject which we are dealing today, the rise of a militarized Asia, I think the real trendsetter is uh, China. I think that's the central focus of the discussion. Uh, Myanmar is uh, undoubtedly a militarized state, but it is not a trendsetter. It's a bit of an outlier uh, in the Asia-Pacific uh, region. Uh, North Korea, uh, Pakistan, yes, they are uh, possibly militarizing at a rate that uh, outstrips their economic ability to support that. But again, they are being managed uh, through uh, separate processes. Uh, i just like to make an, a general point about all these countries. They're all members of uh, the ARF and uh, other parts of uh, the uh, regional uh, uh, architecture, and uh, I think that goes some way, uh, although it doesn't solve all the problems, it goes some way to help uh, manage the implications uh, of their uh, militarization. Uh, on the issue of Cambodia and uh, Thailand, the uh, uh, tensions over the Priya Viha. Uh, Temple issue. I think that was a real disappointment. ASEAN uh, took uh, perhaps a longer time to uh, help uh, reduce tensions over that issue, but I think it's uh, still, you know, you can't expect in matters like this immediate uh, results. You have to have a bit of uh, patience, and that was a general point I was making. If you're looking for immediate outcomes in uh, situations like this, I think we're going to be disappointed. But if you uh, agree that the process itself is important, I think 
uh, after, after a while, uh, things will hopefully uh, help uh, uh, reduce tensions. On the, uh, the, the question about uh, U.S. hypocrisy, I'll do a, a shorter version of, of Aaron and, and simply say that uh, uh, the, the analysis and the analysts uh, are wrong. Um, on, uh, on North Korea, um, I tried to make some brief comments on, on North Korea, uh, but limited to, to 10 minutes, obviously, wasn't able to go into to much detail. Um, so let me uh, just expand upon that very briefly here to say that uh, the, the United States continues to be uh, extraordinarily concerned uh, about the combination of uh, North Korea's continued uh, development of its uh, nuclear weapons and, and advanced uh, ballistic missile program and the, uh, the cycle of prov provocative activity uh, that, that we've seen play out, um, and most recently last year with the Chonan and, and Waipido incidents uh, fr from our uh, North Korean friends over the past, uh, the past number of decades. Uh, the, the other uh, dynamic that we're paying particularly close attention to uh, right now and which we, we hope uh, Pyongyang is as well, is that the political environment in the Republic of Korea uh, has changed considerably o over the past couple of years. Uh, and the expectation that I think has been built into the, uh, to, to the cycle of North Korea's uh, provocative actions over recent decades, which is that uh, the Republic of Korea will simply absorb the punishment uh, and not strike back, is I think a, an assumption that is no longer uh, safe or, or valid. Uh, and so should North Korea choose to take a, a provocative action down the line, uh, I think we face a, a very unpredictable and, and highly volatile um, situation. Uh, and so that is a, uh, a question that we are in a set of issues that we're paying a, a, an awful lot of attention to. Uh, as to why uh, the, the Chinese uh, friends uh, choose to support, as was put here, the bad Korea as opposed to the good Korea, um, let me offer that we have uh, made the point in numerous discussions uh, with, with the PLA uh, in our military-to-military -military dialogue, but, but also with uh, other Chinese national security makers in, in other settings, um, that we think that North Korea represents a strategic drag uh, for, for China. Um, obviously, uh, Chinese decision makers have placed other considerations and, and priorities uh, at, at play. Um, uh, and given, uh, given those other considerations greater, greater weight than uh, what we would consider to be uh, a fairly clear uh, and, and, and objective uh, set of analysis. Um, we know there's a lot of debate ongoing in Beijing uh, about uh, the situation on the peninsula, whether or not China will choose to uh, recalibrate its, uh, it, its policy at some point, uh, give greater rate, weight to uh, relations with the South as opposed to relations with the North, uh, that, that's a question that you'll have to ask to, uh, to decision makers in Beijing. Uh, uh, lastly, on, on Ishisan's uh, question about our, our budgetary politics in the United States, um, l let me uh, simply offer that uh, there, there should be no question in anybody's mind that, that even in the context uh, of our ongoing budgetary debates, that, that this administration is fully committed uh, to making sure that we have the resources and investments necessary uh, to continue to operate effectively in, in Asia uh, and the resources and investments that will be necessary to meet our obligations uh, to, our, to our allies and, and partners uh, and our obligations to, uh, to uphold regional peace, security, and stability uh, for, for decades to come. Thank you. Um, thank you, Michael, and to all four of our panelists for your extremely uh, clear but at the same time concise responses to that uh, range of, of questions from the, from the floor. Um, and even more so, thank you very much for your excellent presentations uh, earlier on. We must bring this session to a close now. Um, and I would ask that you uh, all convene in here again at, at 10.30 sharp uh, after the coffee break. Thank you very much. <laughs>